Good evening, one and all present over here. I, Janvi Shah, warmly welcome you to the panel discussion on intersectionality and access to justice organized by Belong Research Collective and Praveen Gandhi College of Law Center for Conflict Resolution. Now, I would like to introduce Praveen Gandhi College of Law and Center for Conflict Resolution. SVKM's Praveen Gandhi College of Law is a premier law college under the aegis of SVKM. It is affiliated to the Mumbai University and offers a fire integrated law program. SVKM Center for Conflict Resolution was established with the aim of pro promoting alternative dispute resolution as an effective tool for dispute resolution. The center has organized several seminars, stimulation tournaments, and success stories for spreading awareness and promoting ADR. I would also like to introduce a co-organizer for the event, Belong. Belong is a social venture working to promote intersectional inclusion and diversity through its literature, mental health, and research collectives. Now, I'd like to welcome Vedansh to introduce our panelists for the evening. Over to you, Vedansh. Uh, thank you, Jambi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, Vedansh Tripathi, take immense gratitude in introducing our first panelist for today, Mr. Anas Tanvi. Uh, Anas Tanvir is a Delhi-based Supreme Court advocate on, on record is the founder of Indian Civil Liberty Union, ICLU. ICLU is an army of lawyers, activists, paralegals, and students who provide legal advice to the marginalized com communities and make legal information accessible. It is an absolute pleasure to have you amongst us, sir. Our next panelist is advocate uh, Manjula Pradeep Ma'am. Manjula Pradeep Ma'am is an in Indian human activist and a lawyer. She is a former uh, executive director of Nafsrajan Trust, one of the largest Dalit uh, rights organizations in India, addressing the issue of caste discrimination and gender-based discrimination. It is an absolute pleasure to have you amongst us, ma'am, today. I would now like to call upon Yash to introduce the third panelist and our moderator for the evening. Good evening to one and all present here. I, Yashish Prajapati, take immense gratitude in introducing our third panelist for today. Our guest is Dr. Shivali Kumar, who is an associate professor at the Center for Women-Centered Social Work, School of Social Work, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Their research and practice interest lies in the areas of community mobilization, mobilization and collectivization, law and policy analysis in the context of sexual harassment, women and work, livelihoods and development, childhoods and child rights. Earlier, Dr. Shivli was a program associate at Program for Women's Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and as a program coordinator at Prerna Associate CEDPA. Dr. Shivli did her uh, BA honors in history from the Lady Sriram College for Women, followed by MA Philosophy in Social Work from Department of Social Work of Delhi University. And in 2005, Dr. Shivli Kumar completed her PhD in social work from Department of Social Work, Delhi University. It is an absolute pleasure to have you among us today, ma'am. I would also like to introduce our moderator, Ms. Muda Tarek, who is a research associate at Belong Research Collective. Ma'am has done her BA honors from Lady Sriram College for Women, for women followed by postgraduate degree in conflict transformation and peace building from the same. Previously, she has worked with Ally Fellow, Kashmir Education Initiative, and led by foundation. With that, let's welcome Ms. Mudda Tariq Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yashesh, uh, for your kind introduction. We're very happy to have with us Ms. Manjula Pradeep. We're waiting for Anas to, an Anas to join in, but uh, Professor Shivli Kumar has also joined in. So just give me a moment, I'll make them the host and then we can start this discussion. On behalf of PGCL also, Shivli ma'am and Manjula ma'am, I once again welcome you on the behalf of both the organizations. Uh, I think Anas has some issues and they'll try to join in, but we should get going. They've asked us to continue and they will try to join in as soon as possible. So intersectionality and access to justice it's a very it's a theme very close to us at belong intersectionality is an analytical tool for exposing interlocking structural systems of dominance and subordination such as gender caste class religion race ableism and so on the perspective of intersectionality to some degree recognizes the significance of gender but does not 
consider it as the only axis of marginalization. Therefore, an intersectional approach to law can support social justice and bring about substantive equality. We have with us uh, Ms. Manjula Pradeep. Uh, they are a lawyer. They have been working on ground with uh, survivors of sexual violence, with Dalit survivors of sexual violence. And I think my first question is directed to them. So drawing from your own professional experience, how do you think identities can become a barrier in accessing justice? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for this very important uh, session. Uh, good evening, friends. Muda, I think what you have uh, pointed out about intersectionality, I think we need to see the framework of intersectionality and how does it create barrier. Looking at uh, the context with which in the intersectionality is, is defined or is derived from, I would say we are quite behind than um, other countries, specifically United States where the, this word was coined. And maybe we are 10 years or little more uh, where we have started discussing about intersectionality. With regard to barriers in, in uh, to get justice, uh, I think the major aspect of intersectionality is, is that uh, you are perceived as someone who is... Uh, weak, someone who is, uh, who is vulnerable, someone who uh, can, uh, can be uh, abused and without any justice. So if that is a perception of people who are in India and within the, the social structure framework, if you see that uh, where they, how does intersectionality operates in India is well, we talk about caste, we talk about uh, gender, we talk about religion, and we also talk about uh, ethnicity or the tribes, right? And within that, if you go layers around that would be subcaste, cl uh, the class, uh, the, the um, uh, what do you say, the kind of, uh, the if that person is having physical disability or the, her own sexuality. So uh, if I am a woman, right? And I am not just a woman. I also belong to a particular religion. I belong to a particular caste. I belong to a particular class. Everything around me be becomes part of the uh, realistic uh, uh, need of understanding that that is the barrier for me to get justice. And I think that's something which needs to be explored. And uh, looking at the, the scenario of where we are talking about the rule of law and other, other on the other side, we're talking about implementation of laws. I think we also have to see that how does these laws, which which on one side are claiming that they are protecting the, the rights of people who, who are discriminated based on their intersectional identities, are sometimes also violating uh, those lines and, and, and also creating barriers in for those who are uh, basically in the framework of intersectionality. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for shedding light on that. Uh, Professor Shivli Kumar, my question is also directed to you. Could you also break down for us uh, what is intersectional discrimination and why do we need to have these conversations around access to justice and intersectionality? Uh, thank you, Buddha, for this opportunity and also having me with my dear friend Manjula, uh, because we have been uh, not just discussing the concept, we are also seeing it in operation in people's lives. And uh, every time we uh, have workshops or meetings, a uh, new uh, nuance appears uh, with regard to the intersectional discrimination that is happening uh, in our country and also worldwide. Uh, the thing is that when we look at intersectional discrimination, uh, uh, there is a structural reason for it. There are certain people who are privileged uh, in, in every society, uh, specifically in India, we find that, and that privilege brings with them a power to decide um, the institutional systems uh, of justice. You see, uh, who belongs, who is in power to make judgments? Uh, what kind of curriculum is going to be taught in law schools? What should be included, what should not, should be excluded is what uh, is decided by the legal uh, fraternity. So if the legal fraternity has very few representation from, say, the Dalit, the Adivasi, the Muslim communities, their voices get invisibilized. And more so, if they are women in these communities, I would like to highlight that women, other non-normative genders, they get even more invisibilized. So intersectional discrimination works within this institutional framework. 
prejudices these institutional frameworks, ensures that there's no justice given to those who require it the most. So actually, is it justice or is it injustice that is happening? Because the people, the players in the justice system would not want to give that justice to people. Otherwise, you wouldn't have so many number of Muslim people incarcerated, incarcerated in jails, in the prison system, uh, without any justice. They are under trials. They have not met the legal system. That is just one illustration that I'm giving. That uh, the under trials also include Dalit and Adivasi uh, people, and uh, a lot of violence that happens to the women in these communities. Uh, what we find is that uh, the police system does not want to uh, lodge FIRs. They do not want to ensure that their voices are heard within the justice system because most of the police people belong, especially those who are in uh, you know situations of power. Uh, uh, they are not um, uh, the Dalits, they are not the Adivasis, they are not the Muslims, and they are not women. Very few women are part of these institutional uh, power systems. And therefore, intersectional discrimination continues to be perpetuated. And certain people and certain women in these uh, communities uh, remain as mere identities of uh, these communities. Even if they don't want to belong, they are made to belong. They are reminded time and again by communities that, listen, you are a Dalit woman, so you should be doing agricultural work, domestic work. You don't need to come into classrooms. You don't need to come into higher echelons of corporate uh, uh, sector or in government bodies. And you will look at the profile and the data, you will see that it is true because the data does not speak lies. Uh, most of the data shows uh, that majority of people who are in positions of power are people from upper caste, upper class, and of course, uh, from majority religions. So that is how intersectional discrimination works and operates in people's lives. Uh, th thank you for pointing that out. One thing that really stood out to me while you were speaking is how the legal fraternity itself is made of a very homogenous people. It's not representative enough. And it makes me think the curriculums in law school, as you very rightly said, they represent a certain bias. They come from a certain positionality. And it also reminds me of ideas, statistics, uh, increasing diversity in access to legal education. Their statistics show that the majority in law schools are upper caste Hindus. And only a certain section is that of a lower caste, uh, let alone other minority communities. So I I'm also trying to think in the lines that these are law students, these, uh, this particular section then becomes judges, lawyers. So within that section, how is intersectionality? I think this question is directed to Manjula ma'am. How, how do we receive, how is intersectionality treated within these justice apparatuses? Is there a conversation about it within the legal systems in your dealings with all the cases that you've had so far? Is there, has there been this element of intersectionality that has been thought of in the courtroom? There is no element of intersectionality. I think they don't have that lens of intersectionality. They don't see uh, a particular case as resulting out of a, a, a structural inequality. So there is a caste blind, their people are gender blind, right? Religion blind, I think also is a barrier. So uh, I would say personally, I started uh, handling cases at the age of 93. Oh, sorry. In the in the year 1993, I'm not 93. So in the year 1993, for me, the first case which I handled was uh, custodial torture of a young Dalit man who was uh, brutally tortured in the police custody. And then he was not provided proper medical treatment by the community health centers because the police informed the, the doctors not to treat that man. And this man uh, was, they alleged that he has stolen a bicycle. And he had bought a second hand bicycle. The next day, we found his dead body hanging in his house. So for me, that was the realization that I decided that I want to become a lawyer because my background was social work. And that experience made me realize that how difficult it is to address the issue of intersectionality within the framework of uh, legal justice. And in this case, I'm just giving an example. Like in this case, the, the, who was the hero was her mother who was a widow. She's no more now. But uh, when we saw the dead body of this young man, 
I think the the fortunately it doesn't happen in all the cases. Like if you know about Hathras, where the victim was burnt alive by the state by the system. In this case, because uh, the Dalits have this uh, practice where they bury the dead body, so that was the point where we thought that we will go for a re post mortem. I can go and explain you several cases, but this one is so important. That's why I'm explaining. And uh, when we brought the dead body out and we got the re post mortem, then we realized that how, uh, what kind of injuries were there on his body, and the majority of the injury was on his private parts. So if you want to kill a person, you will kill that person on specific areas to uh, to attack that person. So you didn't. You, the police wanted to harm him. Because of his his caste identity, and because of his class, he was a poor migrant worker. And the point is that in this case, the kind of uh, struggle we went through is that the district judge was not ready to listen to us. We went to meet him personally, and the district judge from that he this case was in Ahmedabad district of of Gujarat, and the district judge was was telling us that. i am helpless now you are in this position that you cannot be say that you are helpless because you have the power and what is this just because the police were involved in killing of this man now we people will say this is a case of suicide but this was not a case of suicide it was a case of intersectional way of torturing somebody just because of that person's identity and there are n number of cases in india in any state if you go the way the people's rights are being violated by those who are protecting these rights and as what shivli was saying it is so pertinent to see like i i was a young person like maybe the like these students and when i took a tribal woman to meet the uh, district magistrate because her son was a demanded labor and i took her on the my scooter and i was meeting the the district collector unfortunately shivli he was a dalit and mr gautam was telling me that who are you who has given you permission to to bring these kind of cases and i told him that i am a student of masters of social work from ms university baroda and if you want you can inquire from my faculty of social work but he just pushed me out he just asked me to leave this place not even seeing that person who was injured the mother was injured because she came in in between the landlord and the bonded labor her son forgot and her wrist was fractured so for me i realized this this intersectional framework because i myself i am from the community and i do know what it means to to address for yourself because i also survived sexual violence so the point is that we, there is no there is so much of impunity and it starts from the police station no it even starts before that is when an incident of atrocity happens or violence or a gender based violence happens there are leaders who come there from the dominant caste and also pushing the caste leaders caste council leaders to put pressure on the victim to put pressure on the survivor to go for a compromise or don't go to fire register an fir i i can go on but i must say that the judiciary is so biased specifically those who are in the trial court so don't expect that they will listen to you in the trial court means from the lower court and the sessions court right i have worked more in the sessions court and i have real i have taken so many victims of uh, se sexual violence but also i have handled cases of police atrocities i have handled cases of uh, murders i have i have handled case of flogging of four dalit youth by cow vigilantes so if you want me to give more information about what it means to address the issue of intersectionality with justice it's really challenging and we have to like we keep pushing the system and i must say that if you don't push the system the system will not hear you yeah <clears throat>
thank you so much for sh- uh, sharing that uh, manjula uh, my next question is directed to professor shivli kumar in your book the gendered terrain of maintenance for women and mixed inequalities in culture and law you explored the 125 criminal procedural code a common law for maintenance which is a legal measure that women use to find a way out of destitution and get financial relief when a marriage ends drawing from your book can you talk about the ways in which women interact with legal systems in terms of the trials that they face both within and outside courts in order to be viewed favorably in the eyes of law uh thank you muda you took me back to history and my data collection days outside the uh, session co- courts where i used to wait with the women uh, uh, where they would uh, you know wait for the hearing and they were both muslim women and a hindu women who would seek uh, uh, you know maintenance under this particular law interestingly maintenance is supposed to be a civil subject but why a criminal uh, procedure code is being utilized to uh, award maintenance to women is basically that uh, most of these uh, women were poor uh they came from very um you know impoverished backgrounds and uh, they were married at a very early age and this was irrespective of religion where the difference came because the muslim law was already in operation uh the difference came in my observation of you know the conversation that i had with them and i understood that they are coming to the court because their husbands are not giving them the maintenance that they are entitled in the personal laws we have to understand that both of them are governed by personal laws you know according to the personal law the muslim women is supposed to get maintenance under the for the period of iddat and it's quite a, a big amount because it can be a big amount if they had you know decided that uh, amount before marriage a lot of them did not even know ki nikah nama is supposed to be a contract they are supposed to have the paper in hand and that their meher should have been decided by them the law in terms of personal law the islamic personal law is very progressive that way and since the marriage is contractual uh, they can break it off uh, through either khula which is not very progressive for the women but still there is an opportunity then for them to move out for the hindu women it was a different scenario lot of abuse lot of violence and uh, the fact that they could not bear to stay within that construct of a, a domestic uh, arena and most of these were indigenous uh, indigent women not very poor women and they had to come to the law because they realized that even their own families were not supporting them the families uh, to whom they belong you know the patriarchy lies in the natal families it begins with the birth of the woman of the girl child you know and they are told that they do not belong to their own family there though hindu law has now given the property laws uh, pro- property rights they don't even know that they have right over property in their natal families yeah so forget about the marital family most of the stories unfortunately were led uh, you know why did they come they came because of the extreme forms of violence that they were facing they came to the criminal law because they wanted that violence to stop most of the women said we don't want to dissolve our marriage because that is where we have invested that is where we have spent all our time we have a right to that space okay so our husband needs to give us maintenance and they need to go to jail so that they know that violence is not acceptable you know they cannot violate us so most of the women were talking the same narrative it included the muslim women as well because they were facing violence too within their own household but what was interesting narrative from the muslim women let me just quote this muslim i cannot forget her she turned around and told me ki ye kya mujhe paise dega isko to kama ke main khila rahi thi ab ye jail jayega na tab ye kamana sikhega isiliye main chahti hu ki is law ke antargat isko kuch saza mile you see the 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 base in which patriarchy works that ultimately marriage seems to be the final destination for all women and that is the economic space and it doesn't matter what your husband or who your husband is just damn well get married because you are a burden on my, on your family so this kind of construct continues to rule us middle class women seek it by getting educating themselves and compromising on careers poor women no this is their destination and they have no options they work throughout the day trying to eke out a living earn and look after their families and yet 
they are not respected within their families they face a lot of uh, domestic violence within their own families and in today's construct it's very hard from the, for them to move out of those families too you know because the public space itself labels them as chinal bachalan many other things okay so our society is not exactly very uh, heartwarmingly uh, willing to deal with women who walked out of marriages okay so therefore this crpc really enables them to demand what rightfully is theirs you know because they are doing household work which is unpaid so it should be paid for at least through this maintenance law uh thank you so much for that professor shivli uh i was thinking about what you were saying and it made me think about dalit women who are both under the burden of say the gender the patriarchal burden and then also under the caste oppression uh manjula since your work has been with dalit women uh women victims of sexual violence uh do you think there is an erasure of dalit class overlapping class caste identity uh even the gender identity when it comes to the courts how do courts take these uh case cases is there a deep police politicization of caste that happens a very good question i think uh, there is a politicization of the caste because uh, see in my 30 years of work uh, when i started i realized that uh, Mm, there, like what Shivli was saying, that there is no gender lens within the within the framework of crimes in India. So, uh, so even the police stations are not not women uh, like where they can women feel safe. Like women, like you hardly at one time I I could only see men in the police station or even the lawyers, the judges, and then you're talking about a serious nature of crime, which is sexual violence, where your body and soul. is traumatized you face not only like i have handled case of a young dalit girl of 3 years old up and then until i think i have handled more than 50 cases of sexual violence and uh, the 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 point is that uh, when somebody is raped i think uh, because that kind of uh, protection is not provided to you when you have suffered a, a crime like a a, a a a crime which is on your body that uh, that you yourself are in going through a trauma and on the other side there is no one to understand and then you are also not aware that how do i register an fir you know so majority of the cases of sexual crimes or uh, against dalit women um and because they don't have the literacy rate is quite low and they these crimes are committed in rural areas uh, where they don't have access to higher education so and because they are working in the farms as lab, landless agricultural laborers or wives or sisters of bonded laborers they are uh, so much uh, into this mode of being sexually exploited because until that crime is not reported it doesn't become a case so there is so much of there is a so much of exp- sexual exploitation which which is hardly recognized in the legal framework but those cases which are reported in the police station now who reports the the, the case right who registers the complaint i hardly see a woman police officer reporting the case i have in majority of the cases they were all men and they were majority of them were from the dominant caste i have not seen a single police um, purse officer uh, who was from the community unfortunately i have handled cases of women police constables who have been sexually abused and they have committed suicide during my campaign on against violence against women in gujarat i traveled in 300 villages between 2014 and 15 so if this is a situation how do we deal with this now poxo came up in 2012 uh, right i have handled cases of sexual violence uh, as i said since 19 uh, the first case came in 1997 where the, there was a very uh, gruesome case in gujarat where a 12 year old uh, dalit girl who was working as a farm laborer for because she was she her parents cannot afford to send her to a school and she was being raped so many times and later on the four accused they put her in the tractor and then they threw her from the tractor and the tractor's body went over the girl's body and she died now this was put as a case of accident until we went to the to the uh, uh, high court gujarat high court and we demanded a re 
postmortem and then her dead body her dead body was dug in uh, in a dry pond so we got the dead body uh, dug out and then we got the re postmortem done and then it came out that she was gang raped and was killed so this was a situation but unfortunately we couldn't get justice because again who re reports the case she was not alive right dalit women don't have voice even to say that and to say that and to decide that i want to fight for justice that hardly happens so in this case her father was a complainant and i talked to him he said that uh, no i don't think i can i will fight for the ju for justice so the justice journey, struggle was over so if this is uh, i think this is something we need to understand that there is no protection of the survivors of rape so i have handled cases of gang rape with murder rape with murder kidnapping abduction yeah and uh, by the time uh, the case uh, goes uh, the, the investigation as per the law fast trial doesn't happen fast track investigation doesn't happen then appointment of public prosecutors again men i have in few cases i was able to push to get a woman public prosecutor appointed and i could fight the case and could get justice in a case of a dalit girl who was raped 14 times in an all girls college by six male professors that was in 2008 so i think uh, okay then the question comes is who will give her like the protection and the safe guard of that person where will she go if the parents are not keen to support her in the case right so you need a place to stay and we all know what happens to shivli will tell you about one stop centers all the shelter homes i visited eight shelter homes because there was a petition which was filed in the high court where i was appointed as one of the members of the monitoring committee and the way these shelter homes are being set up where it like jail it's like prison there is no room for the woman to heal herself forget about trauma counseling who does trauma counseling it's us who do our by ourselves and some of us who know that there is a need for this survivor this victim to be taken to a psychiatrist we take i have done it so i am just sharing with you but uh, but there it it is like if you don't push the system the push the system will be happy that okay forget it that whether that girl or the woman gets justice or not it doesn't matter now the last case which everybody talks about is the hatras case okay we all we, we went in the supreme court for the intervention against this uh, uh, good uh, against the up government right we also uh, i also visited the village i met the parents the way they are living the family of these uh, girls the victims parents I, I, as if like there are everywhere there are crpf gu guarding them and all that now did did somebody ask what kind of uh, support do you need for to access the legal system right the kind of image which is created about dalit women and girls that they themselves invite for men to rape uh, not rape them have sex with them i think this is a wrong mindset which is created around dalit women's body where we are perceived as weak we are perceived as someone who are vulnerable and and we don't have voice that's how people have created an image of dalit women and girls and that's why it's so important for us to understand that legal uh, resort or legal uh, support is so crucial for those who who suffer the most in terms of discrimination and violence because of their intersectionality uh thank you so much for sharing that we've discussed about how patriarchy is ingrained in our society and in, in in our institutions we've talked about the nexus of upper castes within these institution and the domination of a certain kind of people within these systems i'd like to take a step back and probe a bit into whether the constitutional provisions in itself fall short of recognizing and doing complete justice to victims survivors of intersectional discrimination or cases of violence where a person's intersectionality becomes the most important factor so i think i would like to direct this question to professor shivli kumar do you think there is a, a loophole within the constitutional provisions or are they sufficient the way they are uh first of all and that's a very interesting question because today we are constantly critiquing the constitution without actually looking at what has been the implementation status of the constitution 
constitutional provisions at all. There is in law two words that are used. One is the fact that uh, de facto you have a law. Like similarly, we have a very uh, uh, broad sweeping constitution. Yeah. Uh, and the other uh, other aspect is de jure, uh, sorry, de jure in terms of the law, but de facto, that is, what are the ways in which constitutional provisions are actually being implemented? Okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, constitutional provisions uh, in place. First of all, I think ours is a most, uh, uh, probably the best constitution in the world and has been acknowledged as such. Unfortunately, we keep tinkering with the broad principles of justice that are laid out in the constitution to suit political ends, okay? So that is one of the biggest problems today. And we are trying to say that the constitution is not relevant anymore for the country. We need to think different, but that's not true. The truth is that the spirit, the value, and the concept of justice as it is embedded in the constitution is not being implemented through appropriate policies and programs by the state the governments that come into power. Why is it that we are not paying attention to the fact that resources need to be put in for better scholarships for our young people belonging to Dalit Adivasi uh, Muslim pop, uh, communities? Why are we not putting in more money? Because the politics of it takes it away, right? So de facto constitutional principles are not being implemented. Article 21 says, and it's a very broad sweep article, Takes talks about right to life. What does it mean? That access to adequate justice system, redress mechanism, availability of that system to the poorest of the poor in our country, isn't it? But is it available? You've heard Manjula, and you know that it is not available because again, of the institutional barriers and the presence of certain kinds of people in power who do not want justice to happen. The constitution says justice has to happen, but people don't want justice to happen, especially those who belong to the privileged communities. It is not accessible to people, the poorest of the poor, poor, uh, poor people, they know their constitutional rights. Most of the people, you go to rural areas, you go to the uh, urban slums, they know kyunka adhikar hai, samvidhanik adhikar hai. How do you get this adhikar? It is the state's responsibility the institution's responsibility, the bureaucracy's responsibility, the police system's responsibility, the legal justice system's responsibility, the medical fraternity's responsibility. Do they know their constitutional responsibilities well? I don't think so. Do they believe in the constitutional principles? Do, have, do they have the sense of constitutional justice? They don't have. Unfortunately, we do not teach the constitution well, well enough. We do not talk about Dr. B.R. Ambedkar in our civics class in class 10 textbooks. We talk about constitution in a manner of, you know, general. It's not important for us. In a civics class, one chapter. What are we doing? We are denying ourselves the opportunity to become adequate, appropriate, just citizens of this country. You know, and that is why constitutional principles are not being implemented well through adequate policies, through adequate programs. If you look at the, I will come just quickly to the budgets that are allocated for uh, specifically the uh, special component plans meant for SC, ST, and women. Uh, you will see the allocations are reducing over the years and they keep reducing. The money that is being allocated today is for real estate development. So much money is going into defense budgets, but no money is being given for welfare schemes and programs, which are actually their right. The state is not a beneficiary. The state is not the ruler. The state is supposed, and we are not beneficiaries. We are citizens of this country. The state has to provide it under the constitutional guarantees. You know, but it does not. There is economic, social, you know, we just look at the implementation rate of right to education. What is happening to Dalit Adivasi children? Are they getting enrolled and then they're dropping out? Are there any measures in place to bring them back to school? What is happening to discrimination within the schools? No record. No allocation of budgets to do training of teachers from the point of view of anti-discriminatory principles. Having understanding of what it means to be a Dalit child, what it means to be Adivasi child, what it means to be a Muslim child. 
is the state doing its job as a duty holder mm -hmm. under the mm -hmm. constitutional law? No, they are not. You know, and that is where we as people who believe in true justice and real justice or de facto justice, we have to play our role and we have to ask these questions. Where is our money going? Where is taxpayers' money going? Why is it not reaching to the poorest of the poor? Because even a Dalit poor person who is a daily wage laborer is paying tax on salt. Remember Dandi March? They are paying tax on matchboxes. Where is that money going? We are not getting any answers because there is no accountability, transparency, or any kind of jawab dehi by the state to us. There is no system of tracking these budgets. You know, so it is not just about the law itself. The law has to be translated into appropriate, just, uh, you know, programs and uh, affirmative action, which is not being done. You know, so therefore we are in a constitutional crisis, as we see, and the constitution is being rolled back by the state itself. Uh, thank you so much for, for that, Professor Kumar. Uh Two things that stood out to me while you were speaking was the lack of political will and poor implementation. But I think I would also want to, uh, uh, I would like Ms. Manjula Pradeep to pitch in here and tell us a bit more about what could be done to further the constitutional commitment to the ideals of justice, substantive equality. How do we address these issues of intersectional discrimination then? Also before Prof. Manjula ma'am speaks, uh... I think what uh, Muda said, and I think one more aspect which came out was also from Ma'am's discussion was the focus on the rights aspect, great, but also you know at the same time the duties, the fundamental duties at times in the course of the discussion in the early classes or in the school education, I think somewhere that also needs to be focused, I feel so. So in a way, I think that is one aspect that came to my mind. But yes, over to you, Manjini. Thank you, uh, Suman. I think you also raised a very pertinent uh, question. Um, as I was listening to Shivli, I was just thinking about that, uh, how serious I became of reading the constitution. Because when we start in the uh, schools, we just, uh, if you, all students know that in our textbook, the first page is like the pledge we say, I, we are brother and sister or whatever, yeah. And then we, sometimes we remember what is a preamble. We, we hardly remember what is there in the preamble. That's the beginning of the understanding the constitution. Now, when we are, even the books which we read, the civics, and the bit we start in, from our uh, secondary education, I was just thinking like what Shivli was saying that, okay, um, when the, you talk about constitution, you also have to remember that who drafted the constitution. So there is a bias around that. And that's why the constitution is not uh, being implemented uh, or, not, or people don't respect the constitution. Because India is, is a country where we, on one side, we have uh, a structural inequality based on caste, religion, uh, and patriarchy. And hence, we, are, we, have, we have the rule of the constitution. We are questioning about it. And on the other side, we have the rule of the caste council or religious councils. So, so we as students or we as children, when we, when we start understanding the, the differences around our identities, we, we are not made aware by our own parents that uh, uh, how do we uh, see everybody with equal eyes, equal. I think if there and those who, who are survivors or I don't want to say victim, but those who are uh, facing this intersectional uh, discrimination, their parents tell, us, tell them that uh, please keep yourself away from others because you would face harm. Or they will try to hide their identity. So my parents, they wanted to hide our caste identity. And that's why my surname doesn't make any sense. Right? So, so in the constitution, it's there's like article 14 also says that we all are, we have to be treated equal by the state. Right? And 15 says, okay, based on caste, class, gender, religion, all this, nobody can uh, discriminate against you. Yeah. So when do I realize it? Because when you when you that thing pinches you in your own personal experience then you realize that yes i have a constitution to protect myself but the constitution doesn't come anywhere in the laws unfortunately 
so article 17 is there we talks about abolishing of uh, untouchability and penalization of those people who practice untouchability but when you yourself have been told that you have to distance yourself from others because you are a lower caste or you are you are a tribal or because you are if you are a tribal you are seen as a someone from the forest a jungly person if you are a muslim you are seen somebody who should not live in this country go to the neighboring country so what does that mean so i think for me the the question which comes is how do the teachers in the educational institutions uh, interact with the students as well so on the one side we have a lived reality of our parents fear but when you go to the school and if you don't see being you being treated equally with other students although you are a bright student but then your caste your class your gender everything comes in our religion goes then you feel that you you don't fit into this uh, educational setting so where do we go we don't have those kind of opportunities so uh, a constitution as we are not taught properly and by the time we we are taught prop, a constitution is when we are in the law colleges and our students know because they are from the law college that how sincerely we read the constitution that is equally a question and the fundamental duties which all which basically it uh, keeps us intact to say that no i will not violate anybody else rights right when you are talking about fraternity equality the principles of equality fraternity right social justice everything comes only in our mind okay so if i am a lawyer will i not take that kind of case where i violate somebody else rights because majority of the lawyers want to make money so we are on one side we are also talking about human rights lawyers but on the other side we also know that to be in this profession you 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 lie and that's why in south people say i am a liar because lawyer they can't say properly they say i am a liar so yeah everybody says that the lawyers uh, are the truthful people if they were, would be then how would they defend uh, an accused who has committed a crime of uh, serious nature of serious nature so there the constitution comes in that if i have studied the constitution thoroughly and if i believe in constitution i will not take those cases where i know that the accused is a a criminal because there are enough evidence to prove that that man it's usually a man who has committed that serious crime because see what has happened in our country is because there is not rule of constitution that's why the conviction rate is also low and if you see the conviction rate the national figures of atrocity acts is for 25% conviction rate but the pendency of the case is almost 95% so where will the people where will where do the hope for justice comes and then as shivli was saying about the domestic violence even that how women are being said that you are misusing the law 498 right what are, why are you using this law you are just trying to punish your husband your in laws i think ultimately what comes around is that to ensure that we live in a secular country we need to understand that constitution should be the first book for each and every child and that constitution has to be taught from our younger age but in a simplified language like we as activists i as a trainer i i know that i work with grassroots activists and i make them paralegals right or barefoot lawyers so what i do is i take the constitution i and then i decide which are the most important articles which i need to teach to the barefoot lawyers or the paralegals and we create a booklet around that i think this is you need to simplify the language because legal terminologies are so difficult for a, an ordinary lay person to understand i hope i make sense <laughs> yes yes definitely uh given that our audience is young lawyers young law students uh intersectionality also highlights the importance of understanding the power differentials between lawyers judges and the clients not only as manjana ma'am also pointed out not only in terms of access to legal language and information but also with respect to complex identities and resulting privileges and vulnerabilities in all of all these stakeholders so how do one how how do these students as young lawyers practice intersectionality and allyship in their uh, hopefully in their work as uh, lawyers and how do they connect one's individual experience of marginalization to the larger structural marginalization that happens 
professor shivli kumar mm-hmm. do you want to take it yeah uh <laughs> thanks for that question because i'm struggling with it constantly as a social work educator uh in trying to work with these young minds and young people who come from a varied background there are people from uh dalit adivasi communities who have their own identities i have one student who comes from a tea garden and uh, there her identity is not of a tribal even though she is an adivasi uh, because uh, of the, uh, the, the problematics of uh, uh, yeah, the location where she is and uh, she's uh, given a sc certificate and the kind of deep marginalization that she has and is facing today uh, in terms of uh, any resource her mother is a daily wage tea even you drink tea next time you remember this that she is a tea plucker and she's paid daily wages and she's given a home to live in and if she doesn't work for a month due to some illness she's evicted out of her home and where does my student go then you know so that is one one student and there are others who are also uh, you know uh, part of that community who belong to privileged communities who belong to privileged classes as young lawyers i think what is important for us to recognize and acknowledge this difference i'm talking of not recognizing as a rhetoric but also acknowledge that it, that there is caste within us there is casteism within us there is misogyny in terms of you know gender relations and uh, deep distrust of the other especially women and the framing of women's bodies in a particular manner you know that it is a uh, woman's body is not hers at all she cannot be allowed to do any uh, anything with it on her own uh, you know consent uh, others have to decide what sari she should wear whether she should wear a uh, hijab not wear a hijab many other things that play out in the lives so we have to acknowledge that that's within us as well we frame people into identities identities and we like to think of people in that manner that needs to be unpacked because if you are going to be just people you have to have a very clear lens of this person is a person first whether it is a, a woman whether it's a transgender whether it is somebody a woman a transgender who identifies as a trans person and belongs to a dalit community intersectionalities right so being able to acknowledge that i need to know more so i need to listen to her more so it takes time and patience to listen you know yesterday i was having a conversation with a young person who kept on saying you know this hijab thing you know the muslim people this this she she's not a muslim herself the muslim woman turned around and said you don't know what's happening to me and what's my context listen to me first and listen to me carefully before you go jump to conclusions yes that is her reality we need to re- uh, listen to it carefully acknowledge it and then say that okay maybe this law can help you and this is how i should work towards justice for you you know so violence has myriad of shapes hinsa ka jo swaroop hai the uh, the characteristic it has many shapes and we cannot be complete experts in all as lawyers let's not have an arrogance of a lawyer let's have the humility of a just person a just lawyer who needs to recognize and understand that the person in with whom you are trying to get justice her reality their reality is more important therefore i need to listen to that entire in, in, in entirety and let's impact that from my own understandings and my own thoughts about justice what is just for you may not be just for this person yeah that person is just framing justice and wants justice in a particular manner you know so which is that has to be understood the other aspect which i often hear as a rhetoric is that you know now there's so much of affirmative action now they are all uh, coming up the excellence of and they are they you other the person what you don't recognize as manjula very rightly brought out the humiliation that a marginalized community face throughout their lifetime the humiliation which walks them and makes them live in fear can be acknowledged that that we are party to that humiliation when we are per- perpetuating similar stereotypes or thinking similar stereotypes no fault of ours either because our parents our society our education uh, system our politics has not enabled us to unpack that we live in a majoritarian world right but we should be ready to unpack that if we want to be truly just 
if Justice P. R. Krishna Ayer could do justice, just giving an illustration, or if Justice Varma could frame justice in a particular manner, those are the role models that we need to look up to and see how did they do their work, how did they acknowledge and change and bring about progressive rulings and judgments. Those are the way forwards, and that was because they engaged with civil society organizations. They engaged with people like us. They had conversations with people working in the ground. They were not just doing their lawyering in chambers. And this is true for corporate lawyers. Those lawyers who aspire to become corporate lawyers should also mandatorily go through this process of engaging with people in the ground. Then only they'll understand who are the people who are climbing the corporate ladder and what do they need to do when they do justice, yeah? And when they do lawyering, yeah, and that's the way forward. And I think it's important for all of us to recognize that, acknowledge that I'm not completely just two. It's a constant, reflective, reflexive process that I have to engage myself. I'm 57 years old. I don't think I'm completely just in my ways of looking at the world. I have my stereotypes. I have to keep on unpacking that. Am I willing to do that? Am I committing myself to do that? To recognize this intersectional discrimination. Then that is the way forward. And that is why conversations like these, which Buddha you brought forth, is very important. And thank you for doing that. Just to put that in on board. Uh, thank you so much for that, Professor. Uh, one thing that you rightly pointed out is the importance of listening. Listening, I think, for me, is the first principle of allyship as well. Manjula, ma'am, would you like to chip in here uh, how to be more intersectional, how to be an ally? as a lawyer in the courtroom? When I was growing up, I was uh, told by my man, if you want to really do good work in terms of uh, understanding a specific uh, issue or a crime, you have to keep your eyes and ears open and keep your mouth shut. See, most, most of the time what happens is as students or as young, now the generation is also changing. So, uh, I think what is needed is also to learn. You also have to de-learn. And the process of, uh, of socialization also impacts your own, own understanding with whom you relate. Who are your friends? Are you uh, having friends from across communities or are you having your own, like what Shivli was saying, your own uh, mindset of saying that, no, no, I will make friendship from my own caste. Like we have social category of forward caste, OBCs, then the shuttle caste, shuttle tribe, Muslims. So who are my friends also makes me speak about what is my mindset. And I think most of us who are trying to work on the issue of inequality are basically saying that if we want to abolish a caste or, or another, uh, other forms of uh, structural inequalities, you need to focus on, on cleaning your own mind. And I think that's what is uh, where if you have a, a sense of uh, understanding that if I uh, I have prejudices, then I as a lawyer might also harm somebody else's rights. So uh, how do I see somebody with not a particular lens? So see, I have also struggled in my own movement of Dalit rights where I brought sent into the center was this gender and how much I have suffered shivly knows. So the point is that the stereotypes which are created around uh, your uh, understanding uh, that you know what I I believe and see is the truth, and each of us have a truth which is different than each other. So I will see a particular situation in a different way because I come from a intersectional framework, and someone who is not uh, who is from a privileged community would see that same situation in a different way. So I think the 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 thing is that. We have to understand that you have to make, if you want to make change, if you want to make social change through legal framework, you need to also understand that how are these laws being enacted? How are they being implemented? Is there monitoring happening around implementation of the laws? Now in the law colleges, I don't think there, there is a um, uh, atrocity act, which is amended in 2015, 16 is being taught. So that is the mindset of the educational institutions that why would the lawyers be taught atrocity act? Because I was, I, for me, I learned atrocity at the age of 22. And I don't know whether uh, any students are being taught about it because I was not taught when I was doing my law. So this is the, the, the situation that even how do we 
uh, teach the students also the curriculum is sometimes also biased towards the minorities like whether ca is been discussed in our law colleges right uh, so all these questions i'm i'm putting it because the students they have a uh, so much access to social media and the digital technology so their mind uh, are also being uh, in the sense they are also being brainwashed if you know what happened with the suli deal and the bully boy who was this boy was a young guy of 21 years old now we cannot blame that but okay he was seen as an accused and he was there was case file against him but there was a larger thing which was around him which motivated this young man to do this so who is the culprit so it's also like when the, the, the why the question is being point, pointed towards specifically male community from the dominant communities why these young boys are not taught to how to behave and why are they been uh, not uh, told that what it means to be powerful so power there is a different so powerful is means you are more violent so why that's why there is so much atrocity is happening that's why there is so much gender violence uh, gender based violence happening so why there is so much of uh, hate hate crime happening i worked during 2002 during gujarat uh, genocide i was a young person of 32 years old i know what it means to like to live in this city where i'm living now so it's also something which is now everything looks very peaceful because these young students they they were must be very young at that time but it's it's like you cannot forget the history you cannot see how these countries are being uh, formed like why there was a division of countries of india and the kind of hatred which is being put around a particular religious minority needs to be understood in a proper legal framework so you cannot uh, take away right of anybody as just because you are born in a particular caste right to being born in a particular caste is not in our hands so we cannot change our caste we can change our gender we can change our religion but we cannot change we can even change our class but we cannot change our caste this is the the truth of india and if for if you see our film which is called as india untouched which we uh, released in 20 2005 and it talks about how caste is intersectionally grown into other religion whether it is islam whether it is christianity buddhism sikhism you name any religion so india is like that so i think our students if they want to become good citizens of this country because india has more than 50% population of young people they can play a very important role in terms of understanding and reading those books which are written by someone who is the best law like who has who was the most literate man in this country was dr ambedkar and there volumes written by him and there is one book which you should write uh, read is a uh, annihilation of caste uh thank you so much for that amanjula ma'am i would now like to open the floor for questions if you have questions please type in the chat box or raise your hand uh yes students feel free to ask we have got amazing two uh guests who have i think got uh, decades of experience at the grassroots and the kind of the work they have done i think it, whatever they have shared it's all speak so yeah uh muda would you like there's a question in the chat box uh, does hearing about the cases make you lose faith in humanity uh anybody any one of you can take this ideally manjula should be answering this question because she's been the one who's been doing all the hearings and the procedural work and support legal support work with the uh, the all the victims and survivors um i hear about her work i support her work one thing that i have never lost faith is in humanity for a simple reason that's the one thing that i can hold on to continue doing this work if i lose faith in humanity i lose faith in myself and therefore i will not be able to do the work that i have committed myself to do you know uh, it is it's horrible to listen to hear whatever fact findings i did earlier uh, in uh, different cases uh, like panjula uh, in haryana and rajasthan uh, they were heartbreaking they were tough 
they made me angry and perhaps angrier today i'm very angry i'm still angry but i still believe that uh, there is humanity because while there are majority police people who may be very bad in uh, actually helping there are a small percentage who are willing to support the same way in the judiciary also there may be a couple of lawyers who and judges who do believe in the kind of work we do as amanjula said that she found public prosecutors women public prosecutors who handled those cases so it just renews our faith in humanity but it's a long way to go because these kind of cases are uh, do shake your shake you completely you know and i know what manjula has gone through doing this kind of work at a great deal of personal loss and i invite manjula to share that you know uh, in terms of uh, the ways in which she is nav- navigating this thank you so much shivli i think uh, mohammed what you have asked uh, is also something that uh, i believe that uh, mm, the losing faith what uh, shivli said is in humanity now i must say that as shivli was saying that i started to become a rebel because i started questioning my parents my father specifically about my caste and why we need to hide our caste and we born as a hindu uh, which was my parents religion and uh, i think it took me i became uh, someone who was atheist like until i i embraced buddhism in 2016 so uh, that also was something which my parents were not accepting me because faith again you say faith in humanity so faith itself is if you, it's a larger definition when you say faith now uh, when some when i used to go in the villages and when as a young person now nobody will question me but at one time people you say that what is your caste and i said my caste is my re- humanity so i believe in humanity and that is my caste and that's my religion so if that is something where you we are not bounded with our identity of a particular caste or religion then i think or gender itself is something where you we lay ourselves as uh, as human beings because we all are discussing about that there are p- millions of people who are treated as lesser humans they are forced to do manual scavenging work where they have to clean dry toilets i have worked with them and how they are mistreated by people who who whose toilets they are cleaning or they are going inside the gutter as you know that a uh, uh, few days back there were four men who died in the manhole in pune so i think this all shake shaken us and i think believe in belief in humanity is so important like for that i left my family i left my parents house at the age of 30 uh, because the the state cid came in my house my parents house to just investigate the my work where i was organizing bonded laborers i left them because i didn't wanted to put pressure on them because of my work my father was a retired government officer so when i moved to another city i did realize that yes i am vulnerable but i knew that now i have i can take decision myself nobody is there to uh, intervene to say that this is good for you this is not good for you because we as an adult we in india we children are being pampered like anything by our parents that we hardly take decision by ourselves in terms of what do i want to do so if my father wants to make me to become a lawyer i become a lawyer or a, or a doctor or whatever rock, or profession see this is what is when i decide to become an activist and a lawyer was my own decision so believe in humanity it's something where uh, a true human rights activist or someone who believe in constitution will never lose hope uh, 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 and will always continue to strive for humanity and if because of that only our world is surviving what's happening in ukraine you all know that where is humanity going people like him are ruling uh, russia and the, india is not far from there but the point is is that we are really being uh, threatened by the fundamentalist forces in the world and it's all impacting us also as civilians and there could be third world war who knows what is going to happen i worked in the united nations and i know i have represented the issues of caste and gender and i do know that okay there is some kind of support system which is there at internationally but we all know that we all are vulnerable it's not that my caste i i if i have that superiority complex of saying oh i am a, i am from the superior most superior caste just because i was born in that that doesn't give me that power to to just say that uh, everybody should respect me and everybody should uh, just uh, tell me, uh, say that what i'm saying is the truth and that's what is the problem of india 
where there a small percentage of people are governing all the system whether it is education politics whether it is economic aspect everything it's surrounded around the social aspect and we are bounded around those identities and we we feel privileged and powerful because we don't want to lose that power we don't want to lose that that kind of wealth which we have gained from our parents see uh, our educational system also like our parents will pay money to for scholarship uh, like like for for the higher education right we don't uh, like it's in the western society we see students uh, uh, paying a student loan taking student loan and giving that in our case we are very different we all are so privileged because if your parents are well off we don't even want to earn because see how our own understanding of a work itself also defines our own mindset so a small work of i i could see big because when i organize conferences or when i work with cases and i could say that okay i am in this position that i will not do certain work because i think that is a menial work so we don't respect people who are a poor people who build our houses or people who clean our toilets or do all the work or those who are house help right because we feel that yeah that is the privilege which i have got so i think that sensitivity is where we lead it leads us to humanity you know humanity is a big big uh, name like big word but then within uh, humanity you have to see what are the layers of humanity where where do i start noticing myself that am i doing something wrong to someone else and where you do this because that is that process where you do self internalization we will start focusing on yourself because we our external world is so powerful that it doesn't allow us to see within ourselves and if we start within uh, seeing a uh, within ourselves we will see that we can also be human beings and because human beings also means you are uh, believing in humanity if you are not human beings you won't believe in humanity uh thank you so much for that uh miss manjula any more questions if not i Anyone? think what you said also reminded me of martin luther king junior's quote uh, no one is free until we all are free and my professor back in college would say that as long as things are making you uncomfortable as long as things are unsettling you you're doing something right uh should i should janvi take over then to wrap this up yeah <laughs> I think uh, Mudha, would you like to also post the link in the chat box? Yes, yes, I'll do that. Yeah. So it was here, and I feel uh, uh, I really feel that at the law college, I think in this in the time that they spend in the law college, uh, I personally always tell them that in their first two three years they should work at the grassroots level, at the NGO level, work with the society because law is for the society. If I did not understand society. i think as a lawyer i am not a complete uh, you know professional in that way so i'm sure all my first year students who is it is first week in the college i'm sure uh, while today morning or i think sometime when i was discussing that why working with the society at the grassroots level is important i'm sure this discussion has thrown that light because it's very important to understand the pain of the other person yes. i may not go through that but it is very important to understand the pain and uh, just if i can just share one example here like when we teach uh, disability or a human rights aspect you know at times i remember somebody blindfolding us and telling us walk now and that feeling you know then which you get so i think very important i'm very glad that you shared so many of your experiences and i urge which i've always been sharing with these students that we need to work in the society first there's life to take up all other matters and as uh, manjula ma'am also said you know one more thing that while or i think even uh, shivli ma'am said that you know you may join whichever professions you want whatever area of practice but don't forget the society don't forget the humanity and i think for not forgetting the society humanity will be alive that is the best way that we can take ahead also as ma'am said there are people who are very good and we can see two wonderful people in front of us so how can we say that there are no wonderful people <laughs> rather three so i think like that there would be and we all can join the school and make it you know beautiful so i'm sure after decades people will say that there are all lot of wonderful people only few are some whom we have to deal with so thank you so much and i hand it over to my um, student volunteer uh, janvi thank you muda you have been really really it was nice to 
see the kind of the questions that you posed and you know the kind of the discussion which came out i request janvi to take over janvi are you there yes ma'am a warm and graceful evening to everyone present here i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion my heart is filled with gratitude and respect for our esteemed panelists for not only sparing their invaluable time for us to grace the occasion but also enlightening us with a commendable talk on the subject heartfelt thanks to belong for this beautiful co association and the committee members who have been working constantly for making this event a successful one last but not the least i would like to thank the audience for their kind cooperation and active participation the feedback form is provided in the chat box please do fill it uh, we hope to see one all of you in our upcoming webinars thank you and have a great day